Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Are you happy this morning? Amen. I don't believe you. Amen. You got all those masks on. I can't see any smiles this morning. Are you happy this morning? Let me see your hands. There you go. That's all right. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. I want to pick up where we left off when I was here a couple weeks ago. Lessons for living in the last days. And uh, if you're like me, do you believe we're living in the last days? Yes. Amen. Several years ago, I remember watching a movie on the television entitled Torah, Torah, Torah. Some of you may remember that. It was a fascinating story of the telling of the events that led to the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. And one of the keys, not only to the movie, but also in historical fact, is the little hints and the clues that were ignored by those in authority and by those of the general public about the impending disaster. And what a disaster. I uh, happened to cross some interesting black and white photos that was taken by a serviceman in his camera that was there the day the, uh, the attack took place. And... With all the things of war, he hadn't had the film developed until about 40 years later. Here's a couple of his pictures you might be interested in from his perspective. You'll notice in this one, it's hard to see unless you're up close. You can see one of the zeros flying in the air as it's continuing the attack. Here's uh, one of the explosions that, of one of the ships. It was an awful day, wasn't it? Awful day. I remember some of my members in previous churches that used to, uh, that had served during the war, a couple of them had been there in Hawaii the day of the attack, and they survived, and it said it was awful. And you see some of the destruction. And with that attack, America went to war. And we went to avenge our brothers who paid the ultimate sacrifice. We went to stop the encroaching idea of a one-world government, went to stop totalitarianism, and we were largely successful. The problem with that is, is that men and women, like both of my grandfathers who served in the war, one in the Pacific, one in Europe, is they're dead now. And time has had a way of slipping away, hasn't it? And the threat and the danger has vanished, and with it, the memory of how horrible things really were. So fast forward 60 years to 2001. It's the beginning of the fall season. Labor Day has passed. Kids are back in school. Everyone is going about their daily routine, and then suddenly, without warning, two passenger aircraft hits the Twin Towers in Lower Manhattan and the World Trade Center. Uh, those towers come crashing to the ground, as you remember. And in the process, another uh, plane hits the Pentagon, another one's taken down by passengers aboard Flight 93 in Pennsylvania. It was an awful day, wasn't it? I don't think we like to see those kinds of things happen, do we? Death and destruction were everywhere. The, the uh, Story, the event shuts down the whole country. I remember that we were in El Paso, Texas, right on the Mexican border. And El Paso was cut off for three days from the rest of the United States, as we could go nowhere because of the movements of troops and so forth that way. I can tell you we watched gasoline go from a little over a dollar a gallon on that day to going to eight dollars a gallon because of the sheer panic that was in El Paso that day. We had students that were coming to the Junior Academy from Mexico and they couldn't go home. So several of us had students that we cared for in our homes for quite a while. I can tell you those are kinds of things you never forget. And of course, now some 19 years later, we're getting more and more complacent about life, much like it was before September 11th in many ways. And through the past 19 years, we have discovered, much like we did after Pearl Harbor, there were warning signs, there were hints, we could have been prepared. Which brings me to the question, what about the future? If you've been watching any kind of news this year, you've, we've had COVID, we've had riots, we've had destruction, uh, we even have elections that aren't, we're not even sure what's going to happen yet on that. What about the future? Is our country about to discover a new kind of disaster that we've never ever considered? Are we facing a complete change in the way our, our country does business? It's a good question, isn't it? Amen. And then it begs a better question. 
Does God's people living in this old world have an idea, any idea, that things may be rapidly changing behind the scenes? I'd like to suggest to you this morning, things are rapidly changing. I believe that Jesus is coming again very, very soon. And I know some of you are going to say, Pastor, we've heard this for years and years and years. That's true. But I believe with all my heart of hearts that, frankly, Jesus is coming as sooner than it's ever been. Amen. And I don't think this is a time to be asleep or to be complacent. So what things can we do and must do to prepare for the return of Jesus? Well, to answer those questions this morning, I want us to take us back nearly 2,500 years ago. And notice with me a fascinating story because I believe in this story it holds the keys to the things we need to do to prepare today. In fact, I believe it is that story that will help us understand where we are today. So I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me back to the book of Esther. And we're going to begin in Esther chapter 2, verse 21. Esther 2, verse 21. And I want you to notice what we find here. And I'll just tell you this, we're, we're kind of setting the scene. This is the setup for the whole story. Verse 21 says this, In those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, I love these words, don't you? Big Than and Teresh, two of the king's officials from those who guarded the door became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. But the plot, verse 22, became known to Mordecai, and he told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Verse 23, when the plot was investigated and found to be so, they were both hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. Pretty serious, isn't it? Anytime somebody wants to assassinate the leader of a country, it is serious business, isn't it? Some of you in this room will remember the day that President Kennedy was assassinated, don't you? It was a sad, sorrowful day, wasn't it? Let me just tell you this. All I can say is, is, God's the one that sets up kings, and he's the one that takes them down. Yes. It's not our business to interfere in one sense. Amen. It's our business to let God do his business. Isn't that right? And so here what we have is an interesting thing. While Mordecai is sitting at the king's gate, and that's where he was all the time. If you read earlier in the book, we see that's what he did. He sat there at the king's gate, and he was a shrewd person at the king's gate because he sat there instead of running his jaws he opened his ears and he listened intently and as he heard he heard this plot to kill the king and he said this is not good Amen. now understand something and we're going to get to this in just a little bit but understand something if anybody had a reason from their heritage or their ethnicity to want the king to be dead, it might be Mordecai because Mordecai was a Jew. And yet, notice here, Mordecai hears this, it moves him, understanding his position and the circumstances he's in, and in trusting God, he goes to his niece, to Esther, and says, there's a problem that's brewing, your husband needs to know about it. Isn't that incredible? Well, Esther tells the king, as we see in the scripture, and there was an investigation. And by the way, if you've wondered about endless investigations, I would just suggest to you from what we see in scriptures, there's been investigations that have been going on forever and ever. And I think they're going to go on until Jesus comes. And in this case, it was found, the plot was found to be so. The men were found... And by the way, you might be interested to know, but several scholars believe that, uh, that uh, Big Than and Teresh were close friends of Queen Vashti and were very angry at her being deposed of being queen. 
In fact, some scholars suggest that Queen Vashti may have had a part in setting these two men up to try to get the king for revenge. Isn't that interesting? And the Bible says the men were hanged. I can tell you from what we know of ancient history of Persia, there was very little tolerance for bad behavior. Very little tolerance for bad behavior. Well, that moves us into something a little more interesting. If you'll look with me as we begin chapter 3 as the story continues, because it doesn't end. So friends, if you are seeing a chapter division, just know that's not how it was in the original language. Here we have the story continuing. It says, after these events, King Ahasuerus promoted who? Haman. You remember him? Promoted Haman the son of Hamadatha, the Agagites, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. Verse 2 says, All the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. Let me stop there for just a moment. Understand about this promotion. This promotion is significant. Um... Haman um, is promoted, as some would say in the ancient language, a vizier, or the prime confidential minister, meaning as he was head and shoulders above any other kind of official. In fact, the only one who had more authority than him was the king himself. And you may remember from the Bible that we see something similar to that. You remember that in, in, in uh, the book of Daniel, we find where Daniel becomes the key man just below Nebuchadnezzar. You remember that? Over all the others. And then it happens again late in life when Darius is on the throne and Daniel's elevated again. You remember that? So this is not an uncommon thing, but it's a very high position. It's something that is remarkable. And it's interesting, if you look at what many scholars say, the vizier never commanded that someone bow down just to pay respect is all they demanded. But here, notice in the Bible it says, notice it says his, his authority was established over all the princes and all the king's ver servants, verse 2, who were at the king's gate, bowed down and notice what it says, paid homage. In the King James it says reverence. Is that a problem? I'd like to suggest to you it is a huge problem. Even though Haman's name meant magnificent, even though Haman was a descendant of King Agad, uh, 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 you know, that's where we get Agagites. He was literally an Amalekites. Even though we find the same kind of thing that we see in the book of Daniel, I want you to understand that this is a problem. It's one thing to have respect and honor it's another thing to worship and reverence. There's a difference, isn't there? I can respect this office. I can respect this person. But I only reverence and worship the God of heaven and earth. Isn't that right? That's the key, isn't it? But notice here, Haman demanded... I want you to see this. Haman demanded... Not only the bowing down of respect, but homage and worship to him. But notice what Mordecai did, verse 2. Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Then, of course, verse 3, the king's servants. This didn't happen just once. This happened on a regular basis because the king's servants said to Mordecai, why are you transgressing? And I like the word here, transgressing. This is more than just, uh, you're just making a choice. He's breaking the law intentionally. Breaking the law intentionally. Well, Why is it that Mordecai refused to do that? Well, if you understand this word 
homage or reverence, as is in the King James. It's the Hebrew word shaka, is, is, is about the word for worship. And if you are a Jew, which we find in verse 4, that Mordecai was a Jew, you know he could not do this because of he believed in the covenant God, the covenant law of God, the Ten Commandments. And as I read the Ten Commandments, I think the Bible makes it pretty clear that it says, Thou shalt have what? No other gods before me, right to begin with. Isn't that right? And so here Mordecai, as a faithful man who understood the word of God, who practiced the word of God, he understood it, he was faithful and honorable to God before he was to mankind. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, in their commentary, says, Haman, being an Amalekite, one of a doomed and accursed race, was doubtless another element in the refusal. And on learning that the recusant was a Jew whose nonconformity was grounded on religious scruples, the magnitude, understand this, of the affront appeared so much the greater as the example of Mordecai would be imitated by all of his compatriots. Had the homage been a simple token of civil respect, Mordecai would not have refused it. But the Persian kings demanded a sort of adoration, which it is well known. Even the Greeks re reckoned it degra uh, degradation to express. Isn't that interesting? So here we have this battle between faithful worship and false worship in this verse. Interesting, isn't it? It seems like I remember Jesus saying something in the New Testament that goes something like this. Therefore, render to Caesar what is Caesar, but render to God what is God's. Is there wisdom in that? Absolutely. There is a time for resistance if it means the difference between serving the Lord first or serving man first. Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. Well, you know what happens here. Look at verse 4. It says, As when they had spoken daily to him, he would not listen to them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand for. He told them he was a Jew. Isn't that interesting? So here he is being charged. He's literally been ratted out. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, that happens with, with uh, in school particularly sometimes. I can remember more than one experience that if somebody did something, trust me, there would be somebody who would see you do it, and they would tell on you. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah. Invariably, what would happen, though, is it would be something like this. And maybe some of you can identify with this. Is, is uh, somebody come up and, and just about mow you over and the, nobody would see that. But the time you responded to get to even the score, you're the one that gets caught. Yeah. That's almost the boat that, Haman, that Mordecai's in, isn't he? He's, he's, he? Nobody saw the, what was going on that way, but they just simply said, he just doesn't worship. And so he's charged. Well, look at verse 5. Notice what the, we find here in the Bible. Verse 5 says, When Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with what? What does your Bible say? Wrath or rage. By the way, that's never good to be that angry, is it? When you have that much wrath, you can't think straight. Isn't that right? That's a fact, isn't it? It's rage that makes for bad decisions. Bad decisions. Notice verse uh, 6 it goes on and says, He disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy what? How, how much? All the Jews. Destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of what? Ahasuerus. Listen, he wasn't just set on getting rid of Mordecai and his immediate family. He wasn't set with getting rid of all the, the Jews that were in, in, um, in uh, Susa. 
He wanted all the Jews to be exterminated from the face of the earth in the Persian Empire. By the way, have you heard something similar to this in the past hundred years? Wasn't very pretty, was it? No. In fact, let me read a few more things. Notice it goes on here in verse 7. It says, in the first month, which is the month of, of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Asia, as you were, you were as pure, that, was, that is the lot was cast before Haman from day to day and from month to month until the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is, I love this, this sounds typical of those who like to cast aspersions, there is a certain people, don't you like that? It's typical of all these people that point the finger. They're going to throw somebody under the bus. There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all the other people, and they do not observe the king's laws, so it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. Did you catch that? Oh, by the way, this is nothing new. You remember just a, a few decades earlier, they remember there was a, a, a golden image on the plain of Dura, and they were all gathered to worship, and everybody was supposed to worship, bow down and worship when the music played, and there were three fellas who didn't bow down. You remember that? And you remember they, they went and they said, hey, there's these three guys who don't love you like we love you, and, and they're just doing their own thing. And you remember it was the same thing. Well, that, let's just get them up here and... And if they don't, we'll just get rid of them. Isn't that sad? Verse 9. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put it into the king's treasury. It's bad enough to just be wiped out. But Haman was so evil that he was willing to pay 10,000 talents of silver to the king's treasury to wipe out a whole nationality of people. Now, if you want to get an idea of that, this is a, a, a talent is a weight of measure. Let me just say it this way. 10,000 talents of silver in the day was significant dollars. Significant dollars. Notice what we find here then. As we continue to read, the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadath of the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. That signet ring was the ring of authority and power. It was the king's seal. And if the king trusted the, the prime confidential minister with it, anything that was done, it was law. There was no changing it. And in Medo-Persia at the time, you've heard that phrase, the, 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 the laws of the Medes and the Persians, it can't be changed, it can't be reversed. It comes from this, this empire at that time. And that was what was going on. If the seal was there, it was a done deal. In fact, you, you may remember in, in Daniel chapter 6, for example, when, when uh, they've ratted out Daniel and he's thrown into the lion's den. And you remember Darius goes and tries to say, well, I, I want to change the law because this is, he's been set up. This is wrong because Darius had given his signet ring. And they said, just remember, king, you can't change the laws of the Medes and the Persians. And you remember Darius was beside himself all night. And you remember the next morning he comes in to, there to Daniel at the, at the edge of the lion's den. And he says, Daniel, servant of the Most High God, has your God protected you? Remember that? And you remember the voice. That must have been sweet music to the ears of Darius. My God has come and his angel has shut the mouths of the lions. 
So here, I'm sure that Haman, in his rage, he gets this law passed. It is a death decree. It's to wipe out all the Jews. None were be t- to be spared. In fact, if you read through here, they were to kill, in verse 13, they were to kill and annihilate and destroy all the Jews, both young and old, women and children, in one day. One day. And they set the time. And there was only one day to worry about it. Several years ago, Levon and I traveled through Europe for a few weeks. And we saw some fascinating things. One of the things that we visited was one of the lesser known, but one of the worst concentration camps during the 30s and the 40s outside of Munich in Dachau. And this is a couple of pictures I'll show you here. And let me just tell you, my friends, this is one of the extermination camps. This is one of the rooms where they gassed individuals with cyanide gas and then they were cremated in the burners. And I'll have to tell you that when I left that place, I was angry. I was angry. Levine Levine says, why are you? She she kept watching me, and as we were leaving that place, I said, this this was fascinating to see. I needed to see it. I'm glad I saw it, but I'm now mad. I'm more mad now than I've ever been. She said, what in the world's the matter with you? And I said, didn't you smell it? See, when you went into the, the, the gas chamber there, they had gassed so many people that all the tile there was impregnated with that cyanide gas that you could still smell it 40-some years later. And of course, when you went by the burners and everything, you could still smell because so many people had been burned and all that brick had absorbed the smell. And of course, that makes you ask the question, Lord, where are you? What are you doing? I won't give away the rest of the story from Esther, but I can tell you God still knows what's going on. And even when you think God doesn't know what's going on, trust me, he has things in the palm of his hand because he is a sovereign God. The truth of the matter is, my friends, The Bible tells us that letters were sent out. A copy was given to every province published for all the people. Verse 14, verse 15, the couriers were impelled or compelled to issue the king's command. And I want you to notice something interesting here. Something interesting. Haman and the king sat down like there was not a problem at all. If you look there in verse 15. But the city of Susa was in total chaos and confusion. Now, I'm not going to go into chapter 4 today. But I do want us to think about something here. Because there is a time coming in the very near future where there is going to be a crisis as we have never seen before. And I'll be candid. I don't know if it's already beginning or if it's soon to begin. I can tell you with what we've seen in the last few weeks and months and what we've seen with uh, elections this week, I can tell you I've had phone calls from some that are elated and some that are in sheer panic. I had a call from one lady this week who told me, she says, I don't know what to do. I'm so distressed. And I said, sister, quit worrying about this or this and start looking up. It's not about this or this. That's what the devil wants us to focus on. What we have to remember is that God is still in control and he will take care of it in his own way, in his own time. Now I recognize from subtle beginnings and without much thought, the work of the enemy is continuing to grow, isn't it? In our country, we have a constitution that, uh, sadly, I'll just say it this way, has been bypassed more times than I'd like to admit. 
In fact, over the past few years, there have been laws passed, executive orders signed that kind of tear or take away of the freedoms that we're accustomed to that are in the Constitution. But I'll tell you what, when we start tearing things apart, let me just say it this way, totalitarianism is not a good thing. Some of you can look back in history and in the past hundred years we've had two significant examples. You might say Russia at the beginning of the 1930s, the 1920s and 30s, and of course Germany in the 1930s, and all I can tell you, the result was a twisted mentality that led to a world war and a destruction of nations and eventual persecution and slaughter of human beings that the world had never seen before. And I'm here to tell you, the devil wants those kinds of things to continue. That's exactly what he wants. And in the future, understand that this is going to come in, in a situation where it's going to come down to it, what it was for Mordecai, is the fact it's an issue of loyalty versus that of worship and who you worship. That's what it's coming down to. Daniel foresaw that time and vision in Daniel 12, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, he says, At that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. I like that, don't you? Amen. There will come a time of distress or trouble such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. I'm not sure I like the sound of that, but here's the good news. At the time, your people, God's people, everyone who is found written in the book. What book is that? the book of life, will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake and those to everlasting life. Amen. Some of you may be saying, well, pastor, are, are, we, are you really sure about that? Well, let me share a couple of things with you. In the fifth volume of the Testimonies, I find this, hang with me now. Church and state are now making preparations for the future conflict. The decree which is to go forth, and by the way, I should, uh, should mention, the way is being prepared for the manifestation on a grand scale of those lying wonders by which, if it were possible, Satan would deceive even the elect. And it goes on and says, the decree which is to go forth against the people of God will be very similar to that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews in the time of Esther. The Persian edict sprang from the malice of Haman toward Mordecai. Not that Mordecai had done him harm, but he had refused to show him reverence which belongs only to God. The king's decision against the Jew was secured under false pretenses through misrepresentation, misrepresentation of that peculiar people. And Satan instigated the scheme in order to rid the earth of those who preserve the knowledge of the true God. But his plots were defeated by a counter power that reigns among the children of men. Angels that excel in strength were commissioned to protect the people of God. Isn't that good? Amen. Yes. Now, let me read on here. The same masterful mind that plotted against the faithful in ages past is still seeking to rid the earth of those who fear God and obey his law. Satan will excite indignation against the humble minority who conscientiously refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. Men of position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against the people of God. Wealth Genius, education will combine to cover them with contempt, persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them with voice and pen by boasts, threats, and ridicule. They will seek to overthrow their faith. By false representations and angry appeals, they will stir up the passions of the people, not having a thus saith the scriptures to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Well, John on the Isle of Patmos sees the same kind of thing. 
he sees the same thing. If you remember Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 to 17, there is coming a time when it will be forced decisions about worship. And those who don't have the mark of the beast in their forehead or their hand will be commissioned for death. And it'll be under the guise of worship. They'll be marked for death. In fact, this is an interesting one as well. The decree that will finally go forth against the remnant people will be similar to that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews. When the protection of human laws shall be withdrawn from those who honor the law of God, there will be in different lands a simultaneous movement for their destruction. As the time appointed and the decree draws near, the people will conspire to root out the hated sect. It will be determined to strike in one night a decisive blow which shall utterly silence utterly silence the voice of dissent and reproof. The decree will go forth that they must disregard the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and honor the first day or lose their lives. Now let me just tell you for what, folk. Paying respect to Haman may not have seemed like a large thing at, the at that time of the world, but to Mordecai it was life and death. And that's what's key here. It was life and death. And I think that's something we need to keep in mind as we go forward here. Life and death. It's kind of like, um, I remember the great theologian Melanchthon saying years ago in the times of Martin Luther. He said it's basically like this. In times of peace, there are primary things and secondary things, but in times of persecution, everything is primary. I want you to think about that. We may have differences of opinions in times of peace about this, that, or something else, but when it comes to persecution, we must always be on the side of God. You never compromise principle. You never compromise biblical truth. Can you say amen? I think there's some lessons to learn then out of this experience of of. Haman and Mordecai and Esther for us in the day that we're living in. Here's some of the things I think we need to remember. Number one, complacency is never good. This is not the time to zone out and say, hey, it's all going to be okay no matter who does that. No, no. As a child of God, we must be ever vigilant in the study of the Word of God. The Bible must be our textbook. Can you say Amen. We must watch what is going on around us and always then come back, not because of somebody's opinion that you like, not because somebody is a silver-tongued devil. You need to come back and check it with the Word of God. Amen. That's what it's about. We must prepare for what is going to happen in the future, and it has to be now to prepare, not sometime in the future, because if you do, it's too late. Right. Secondly, I'd say this. Never compromise biblical principles, even in the small things. We're living in the last days. We need to practice now to prepare for the great day that is coming. You see, the small tests today prepare us for the big tests in the future. Number three, our enemy is always out to get us. Is that a fact? Yeah, Satan is trying to take us down. You remember what, uh, what we find in the book of Ephesians? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places, principalities and power. They're, that's who, what we're wrestling against. And so what is the solution? Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. Isn't that right? Whole armor of God. Absolutely. So my friends, we must be armed with the armor of Jesus. Number four, we must always, I repeat always, cling to Jesus. Amen. I heard a politician one time that said that Christians are bitter clingers to, to their God. Well, I hope so. That's what we're supposed to do is cling to Jesus. Isn't that right? We can't do it. We have to claim his promises, trust his promises, believe what he's going to do, and then follow him. Don't only hear it, but act upon it. Isn't that right? Amen. 
You know, the world may be looking like it's going to close in on us, but remember, our God is still in control. Amen. So we must focus on Jesus Christ. And number five, the last thing here, don't panic. He will see us through. Isn't that right? Remember what we just read in Daniel? At that time, Michael, your great prince, will arise and rescue all that are written in the book. Isn't that good? Oh, I like this in Psalm 91. You know it. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of what? The Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall find what? Refuge. Notice what it says. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day. He goes on and says, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not what? Come near you. Can you say amen? Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Notice what he says. No evil shall what? Befall you. Nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Amen. And verse 11 says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in how much? All, All your ways. Now, folk, I have to tell you this. Some of the things when we hear and see in the media and in our world around us look pretty scary. And frankly, they should scare us in one sense. Scare us enough to get on our knees Amen. and get with him. Right. But when you're on your knees with him, we need to rise up from that with great courage and strength and know his promise is still sure. And if you believe him and trust him, he will take care of you. Now, some of us may be laid to rest. That's not a loss in the sense of the devil gaining victory. Because if you love Jesus, the next thing you're going to see is Jesus at the resurrection. So understand what I'm saying here. There may be some ugliness and some loss. But if you're trusting in Jesus, it's all right. Makes me think of my great friend, Ron Halverson. He went to see his doctor, and his doctor was very worried about him and said, Ron, you should not go to this appointment and speak at this camp meeting. If you do, you could die. And in typical Ron Halverson form, he said, well, now, Doc, let me ask you a question. If I go and I preach and I'm in the middle of preaching and die, uh, that's okay, but I could live too, couldn't I? And the doctor says, yeah, you could live and keep on living. Well, either way I win, he says. Well, folk, that's what it comes down to. Whether we are laid to rest or whether we're living is not the important thing in one sense when Jesus comes. The difference is it's who we know is what counts. Amen. And who we've committed our lives to is what counts. And all I can tell you is, folk, when you see all these things around, don't look to you. Look to Jesus. Make that decision to commit to him and follow him everywhere he leads. And let the Holy Spirit give you the holy boldness you need to live in faith and with great abundance in your life for the cause of Christ. That's the only decision that counts now. Live for Jesus. How many of you want to live for Jesus this morning? Praise the Lord. Don't worry about what somebody says down the street or what they tell you on the TV tonight. Just remember, this is what leads to life. You see, King Jesus has made this promise. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. I don't know about you, but I'm anxious to see him and to receive his reward. How about you? Amen. Amen. Let's stand together to sing our closing hymn, Under His Wings.
And let's sing it with a, a joy that we've never sang it with before, maybe. Under his wings, I am safely abiding, though the night...